Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much for coming and joining us. I'll put this thing down just for the moment. My name is John Colm. I'm the CEO of Team Results USA. We are a team leadership development company. This gentleman here is Corey Lux, who is the technical director of Team Results USA. Uh, for our trainings, we use a, a good deal of technology, um, and we're really trying to push the boundaries and take it to the next level, and that's why we need Corey. The subject today, though, is team neurodynamics. Um, I'm satisfied having studied this for a couple of years now that this is a science that is about to change everything, and I mean everything, that we know, do, thought we knew in the training and learning business. And that applies, to, of course, to all of us in this room, myself and Corey equally as well. Today, we hope to give you a demonstration of something really amazing, and later after the session, if you want, you can play with it yourself. Right now, these two lucky people get to play with it. <laughs> And what they're wearing on their heads is receivers, and I'll explain that in just one moment. So we're going to talk, we're going to give you a little demonstration, talk a little bit more, and then pause for questions. If you have your clickers with you, as Corey says, we have integrated that technology in our presentation, and it would be great to get some opinions in a couple of minutes. The subject, just to make sure you're in the right place, is chasing the butterfly, which is a reference to nonlinear dynamics, emerging behaviours, it's the butterfly effect, is what that refers to. Chasing the butterfly, team neurodynamics, and the new normal. Before we go any further, I'd love to ask you a question, and it's not a rhetorical question. It's something I'd really love to know the answer to, given that you're all experienced training officers in the government. Think about the people who have provided you and have in the past provided you with any kind of team leadership training. And think about your own position, of course, evaluating those suppliers and deciding on the quality and the age of their ideas. I would be fascinated to learn what you think the average age of the idea is in team dynamics that are presented to you by vendors. For example, do you have them talking to you about things like um, about things like the hierarchy of needs? Uh, that's Abraham Maslow. That's early 1960s. Are they talking about the work of Carl Gustav Jung, which was early as that turn of the century kind of thing? Are they talking about forming, storming, norming, and performing? That was Albert Tuchman. Mid 1960s, whoops, I don't know why I used it there, thank you. Mid 1960s to very early 1970s was Albert Tuckman, Peter Senge, 1980s. Just generally, what do you think the average age is of the ideas that people bring to you in the area of team leadership development? I'm going to hit a little button here, and according to the technical people, you have 30 seconds in which to answer it, we should see your answers. So there we go. Oh, look at that. That's cool. 14 responses. See, we didn't know this would work until right now because we didn't have an audience for the <laughs> All right, 10 seconds to go. And time's up. Polling is closed. And I think I pressed the button one more time, do I not? To find out what the results are. Look at that! Oh, oh this, is, this is incredible. This is really great. So, <laughs> so the great, this is and by no means to reject any of these other views, because of course you're the experts here and your viewpoints are all valid. But what interests me is that the majority of people are saying that the ideas that are being brought to them are 1990s era and 1980s era. And I have only one point to make about that, too, actually. First of all, I also have been doing 1990s and 1980s era stuff for a long time, but my point, of course, is it's 2014. Um, oh, and in case you're wondering who I am, has anybody noticed I have a foreign accent? Can you tell me? <laughs> really? Yeah. I'm from the South. <laughs> <laughs> the deep South. Any further South, you'd have to be a penguin. <laughs> I'm from Australia. I worked in the Fed for 10 years. I worked in the intelligence community. Um, and in Australia's version of the National Security Agency, and then I came over here and I worked for the National Security Agency and the CIA for a, a long, long time. Uh, left those agencies and started Team Results as an Air Force fighter pilot named Peter Ring uh, in the mid-1990s, and we were really interested in the ideas of simulation and whether simulation could be applied to team learning. So we were trying to pioneer all that stuff. Everybody knows what a virtual reality game is now, but then nobody knew when the term didn't exist. Thank you very much for this. That's fascinating. I'm going to keep that data. If I have one message for you today, and this little guy is going to, I love his expression on his face, and he's wonderful. This little guy is going to pop up a few times during today. 
This is the era we're on. This is why it's an exciting time to be in the business that we're all in, because science is finally catching up with us, and it is finally providing us with the tools we have always needed to tell the difference between training that works and training that doesn't. In the old days, we used to just take our best guess based on their education and experience, and of course we all had to contend with vendors and suppliers making at times wild claims. What's available in the future is a chance to measure and see what's really going on in the brain. Are people learning or are they not? And to prove whether they are or not. Because the truth is, this is Hector, by the way. Everybody say hello to Hector. <laughs> Every psychologist has one of these. <laughs> the truth is, and this is what fascinates me, think of all the libraries in the world and the tens of thousands of books. Leadership, teamwork, training, learning, memory, retention, anything to do with the things that are the tools of our daily lives and our jobs. And yet, 100% of the mystery of that is wrapped up in about a pound and a half of tissue. This is about life size. This is the most complicated thing we know about in the universe. Nothing else to even come close. And our beginnings to understand that are really just beginning and remind me every time I look at Hector at the Robert Frost poem. We dance around in a ring and suppose that the secret sits in the middle of his nose. The brain knows how it works, but we don't know. We're going to do a demonstration for you now, and I'm going to explain beforehand how it works. Sorry, I don't know. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to, to have you thank our two volunteers, because they volunteered without really knowing what we were asking them to do, which takes a bit of courage. So, Nick Bonham from OPM, give her a hand. And Doug. Griswold Leadership Strategies. Doug from Griswold. Thank you. Doug from Griswold Leadership Strategies. Give him a hand. And thank you so very much again. Corey Lutz, our technical director, will take off in a moment. So what's going on here? We are going to show you that it's possible to measure two things in the brain very easily, and this is all new development. The first thing that can measure is engagement. Engagement is just what it sounds like. It's how involved you are, how focused you are. This is engaged. This is disengaged. <laughs> Next thing we're going to measure is workload. Related to difference. How hard you work, how much effort you're putting into it. This is high workload. This is low workload. <laughs> or something like it. Fuck <laughs> it. <laughs> 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 I can do this all day. <laughs> we are going to show you that we can measure these two things. These two folks here, uh, Meg and Doug, Meg and Doug, are standing there and they're looking at this device. Uh, we call it manual rod. This is my wife. Uh, who's channel one, please, sorry? Doug. So Doug, please put your hand up again. Doug is person one, and Meg, put your hand up. Meg is person two. They are wearing EEG receiver headsets. They're, those headsets are real. There's nothing made up or imaginary about this demo. And those things are measuring the signal from their brain. They're measuring engagement and workload. This is what the headsets look like. So let's suppose for a moment that Doug is on channel one. Begins to concentrate a little bit. This is what we're going to see. Do everybody see the red light go on? Mm -hmm. They can raise their engagement and workload a little harder. The yellow light goes on. They can raise their engagement and workload a little harder. The green light goes on. The minute the green light goes on in channel one, we have a little vehicle known as the mind control vehicle. <laughs> the movable brain. And the minute the green light goes on, it will start to do this. So it will start to do a hard left and go round and round in circles. Now we'll ask Doug to relax and we'll ask Meg to focus. Not yet, this is just a demo. So Meg begins to focus. She turns on the red light. She turns on the yellow light, she turns on the green light, and that causes the little thing to go around and around in circles in the opposite direction. Now I'm sure you know where this is heading. We tell her to relax. Now the question is, what if we can get them both to raise their engagement and workload together? The way we always want to do when we teach and train people, the way I'm hoping folks might be doing right now. Well let's suppose they can do that. So they're going to start focusing, they both go red, they both go yellow, they both go to green. Now it's going to operate both tracks in the little track vehicle, and the thing is going to go more or less straight. The goal of the mission, get out of trouble. The vehicle's going to start here in the middle of the sumo ring. We'll ask you all to gather around in a minute.
These folks are going to try as hard as they can to steer it. And let me tell you at the outset, that when it begins, if it looks like it's not working, it is working. What we're asked to do is really, really, really difficult. And this is one of my points later in the presentation, actually. And they, of course, are going to try and get the vehicle out of the ring where somebody can pick it up. And if they do that, they've been successful and they win a prize. What do you say? Are you willing to help us? Yeah. All right. Well, in that case, uh, I will hand over to Mr. Corey Lux, Technical Director of Team Development. So everybody, if you like, just get on your feet and gather around the sumo ring so that you can see what's going on. Just stand where you can see what's going on is all I'm asking you to do. I'm going to step in the middle of no man's land here. While Corey's doing that, I'm going to show you something else, which is really important, and it's this. You might be thinking right now, if you're a step ahead, these folks can see the box and they can see the lights go on and off, but we can't, so how can we know what's going on? Well, that's why we set up a webcam for you. <laughs> and you can see the box and you can quite clearly see that this is uh, my video and that nothing's been placed because you can see Corey fiddling around in there doing this to work. That's the webcam right there. That's the webcam right there. All right. Oh my gosh, this one is I found this really hard to do with the first building technology. Ready? Okay, so back we go. You always 
wonder if this stuff will work, because what I'm showing you is leading edge, okay? You guys, the people who have seen that demonstration at this point are Corey Lux, myself, and Nanda Villa, our office manager, and my wife, <laughs> <laughs> who has a PhD in, in math, so she helped us with this. Okay, um, I don't know why for reset, but we'll just have a quick revision, shall we? <laughs> Let's talk about the real science. In the real world, we're not using these simple headsets that you saw. We're using these ones. This is a much more complicated headset. It takes an hour to get it on. You need to wash your hair afterwards because sticky electrical goop is involved. It, of course, measures in far, far more detail than we could ever dream of doing with these things. These little headsets here are made by a company called NeuroSky. Uh, they make the chipsets. We built the device, the Mandelbrot device you saw was designed and built by Team Result. But we use the EEG chipset from HeroSky. Those headsets there, thirty to forty dollars each. These headsets here, twenty thousand. <laughs> we are partnered primarily with UCLA, the University of California, Los Angeles, specifically the Brain Research um, Laboratory at UCLA, which is headed by a fellow named Professor Ron Stevens, who has been a major collaborator with this work. We had a lot of early success, which I'm about to show you. We learned some completely amazing things about team dynamics that nobody knew. At that point, three other institutions, two other institutions, part of the answer they could join us. One was the University of Arizona, and the other was Sandia National Laboratory. So it's right now a team of four. Team results, Sandia, UCLA, and the University of Arizona. That, by the way, is, uh, is um, Amanda Villa, who is our office manager. <laughs> and this is Ann Wilberg, who's our legal and contract advisor. But on that day, they were experimenting subjects. <laughs> Ann's looking a bit nervous, if you ask me. Trisha Galloway from UCLA was the EEG expert, and you can see here that she's been fixing these. But there have been many, many experiments done with two photographs and one. This shows you the level of complexity. We have that simple little box here. This is what it takes to do the real thing in the real world. There's a hundred thousand dollars worth of computers alone there, two little special computers. And here's what we had people do. That's a little vehicle, and we were having them steer the vehicle around. I don't want to get into the details of how we did that because it wastes time but it was not unrelated to what you did today that we were not using EEG signals to steer the vehicle, we were collecting EEG signals. It was the exact opposite of that. But just so you know, this is the vehicle. Uh, it's a turtle, technically it's a turtle. It's a thing you can move around and, and thereby observe the effect of behavior, and that was the control of this before it. But now let's get into the science of it and see what's really going on inside people's brains, because as training officers, this is the thing we'd love to do. We would love to have people in our classrooms and in our programs with perspex, perspex heads, perhaps three little lights, <laughs> so that we could see inside and see what level of attention and focus we're getting, and maybe titrate that for the content we're preparing. What you're looking at here is a four-person team. Just because it's simpler to show, we actually use somewhat larger teams. Person one, what you're looking at there is their engagement. So you can see person one is highly engaged. Is there anyone who did not understand what I meant by that? Because I would hate to get that wrong. That is an important point. Is it, is, am I being sufficiently clear when I say that person one is highly engaged at that moment? Okay, good. Person two is kind of engaged. Person three is just yeah, somewhere in the middle. And person four couldn't care less. <laughs> so what we found doing this research with UCLA was that there are about 25 patterns that you observe in the team. 25 different constellations, distillations, profiles of mental engagement as a team does a task together. So, for example, here there's clearly one person with high engagement and everyone else is just kind of sitting there and maybe doing what they're told. Uh, this is about it. Um, here you can see something very different. Everybody in the group has got high engagement. And that, of course, was the condition that we required to make this demonstration work. We asked Meg and Doug to both get their engagement really high, and only when it's really high does the vehicle go straight. UCLA came to us with results like this, obtained primarily from the US Navy from nuclear submarine teams. A lot of this work we've been doing with teams that run nuclear submarines. It takes six people to run a nuclear submarine. We've also experimented with volunteers. Um, and we've asked the NSF for one and a half million dollars just now to do more research with kids. The University of Arizona, by the way, thinks this could be a diagnostic for early onset autism, which is something that never crossed my mind. Ron and I were only thinking about teams and teamwork, team dynamics and workplace teams, because that's what we do. But that would be great, it would be a nice idea. So what are we observing here? Well, the team, fairly obviously, 
might in one moment go from, let's say, this catnip and go to that one. And then the next place they might go is there, and then there, and then there, depending on what's going on. So if you go around that and colour it, we can see the transition from one to the other. The first thing I want to point out is that we know we're seeing something really exciting and new here. How do we know that? Because here, for what we're calling the easy problem, we see a really clear pattern. Here for the hard problem, it's an even clearer pattern. And this is what no results would look like. That's what randomised. So if we got that, we know we haven't learned anything. And clearly we've found some stunning things here. The hot spots are the most frequent transition. And look how it changes. This is the problem you actually saw with the little green car earlier on. These are the EEGs from that one. And you can see that Corey set up a fairly easy course and then he set up a significantly harder course. Look at the difference. Look at the change. Look at the cognitive difference. But what these diagrams reminded us of when we started looking at them was the early X-ray crystallography diagrams of Crick and Watson. Complicated back when something amazing and cool is clearly going on, but you kind of hope that there's a simple explanation underneath it. Well, for Crick and Watson underneath it all, it was what if this thing was shaped like a helix? And that became the DNA molecule. Is there a DNA molecule for this sort of complexity? Because this on its own is very interesting, but I'm not a scientist, I'm not an engineer, I'm a professional trainer, you're all hirers and doers of professional training. We need something that's practical for us every day. Well, we did a taxonomic analysis of this team of dots here, and we came up with some fairly stunning conclusions. The state that you saw the two, our two volunteers, Doug and Megan, earlier, the state where engagement is uniformly high across the group, we're calling collegiate. That's the classic, everybody holds hands and sings kumbaya, <laughs> we're all one big team, the thing that makes many of our, your and my partners roll their eyes when we say it. But that's what collegiate really is. It's everybody's participating equally and to the same high level. But we found that there are four other states that completely describe teams and give us a conflicting new model for team dynamics. The next state is dominant, we've all seen it a thousand times. Dominant, of course, is one person is pretty much running the show, and the rest of us pretty much follow along. The dominant personality might change from moment to moment, but there is a dominant personality in that mode, in that state. Dormant, the exact opposite of collegiate. Don't tell me you haven't seen this before. Not in our own classes, of course. It's always in the class run by the person before us. <laughs> when you come in and the people just look like they're... And you, they're somewhere, but they're not there. They're not in the classroom. They're on the beach. <laughs> they're at home. They're back at work. They're not in the classroom. Everybody's tuned out. Dyadic. That's a term that comes from the ancient Greek. I, showed, I, I pulled it from the ancient Greek. Technically, dyad means two people, but I took a few liberties with it. And what I mean by dyadic, what Ron says that I mean by dyadic, is there is a small leadership clique. Not one leader, but a small leadership group that's kind of running the show. Well, we've all seen that before. And that brings us to the fifth state, which we've also seen before, outlier. The whole team is pretty much on song, except for a few people. And that small group of people is tuned out. And we've all seen it. So what we've come up with, this brain here, is a metro map for team dynamics, the team dynamics, and these are the metro stops. It's possible to travel from any state to any other state. So if you want to draw a metro map, that's what it looks like. So we can go from any state to any other state any way we want. I did make one big mistake with this model, so did Professor Ron. We should have given it a name. We should have called it something when we wrote the paper. We didn't. We just said, hey, here's a model. What do you think? So unfortunately, it's now become known as the Colin Stevens model in the academic community. I would rather have had a cooler name, like the Starfish model or something. But we did nothing. If you, if you write something new academically, you don't need a name, I'll name it after you. So look out. That's what I learned. What's the message here? The message, of course, is that we're iterating towards the replacement of charlatanism and wild claims with real science. And I'm going to come back to that in a minute, but I still love this guy with his wonderful pure science. What do the results look like from actual teams? What we're looking at here is the group that Corey set up initially, the group that you saw on the image with the people steering a little car around, and this is the easy problem. Um, rather than force you to stare at those, those are transition probabilities. How often do they go from that state to that state? They all add up to one. Rather than make you stare at it and look for the patterns, we did that for you. So in the easier task, we find that they spend most of their time in the outlier state. That's where they spend most of their time. Most people are on song, but a few people are not. They're zoned out. They also spend a fair bit of their time in the dyadic state. 
a small group is running the show, everybody else is happy enough to go along, they're getting successes, but their engagement is significantly lower. Um, what else is worth noting? Look at this one. The transition from collegiate to dormant only happens 1% of the time, either way. Collegiate to dormant or dormant to collegiate, this is very rare. The group hardly ever goes directly from the state where they're all really focused to where they're all really zoned out and unfocused. And that kind of makes some sense to me, based on what I've seen over 20 years of running team and leadership programs. It's not that you can't go from collegiate to dormant, it's just that it's kind of like driving from New York to LA. You can't do it correctly, you're going to have to go find some other places to get there. Let's make the problem harder. And I urge you to stare at this really hypnotically because it's almost like a movie then and you can see things change. So, hard problem, things to note. So, look what's popped up. Suddenly, the dominant mode becomes very popular. Dyadic is the most popular, the dominant is almost as popular now. Why? We think it's because when we, when we make the problem harder, there's more of a tendency for somebody to say, hey, come on, we're getting nowhere, guys, just, just let me see if I can help. And people go on with that willingly enough if they've seen the same success. By the way, team dynamics don't just change based on feedback. We always thought that was true, it's not true. Team dynamics change based on anticipation as well. We got a huge market for anticipation from this work. So when the team thinks it's about to succeed, its dynamics change in advance of the success as though they had succeeded. And they stay that way right up until the moment of feedback. And if they succeed, the entropy gets even lower. And if they fail, everybody goes, oh, crap, and the entropy goes back up. John? Yes. Can you click back on the collegiate of the easy? Yes. I just want to see what that tells us. Uh, there you go. Collegiate of the Four to one. That's kind of persistent. Isn't it? Yeah. Um, Pay off theorists would call that cuss behavior. It's a bit beyond the thing today, but if people want to talk about it later, I'd love to. Okay, so that was that. Now, this is a team of nuclear submariners. So what's fascinating about this is these are the only people in the United States, other than the president, that have permissive authority for the use of nuclear weapons. So you better hope that their team dynamics is good. The Navy invests very heavily in that. They have asked us to study their team dynamics. This is a preliminary finding. This is a group of real submariners in a submarine bridge in the basement of UCLA. <laughs> It's a secure facility, it's a phase of reproduction of nuclear submarine bridge, and they're managing a dangerous scenario. They're piloting the sub through something. The most dangerous time for a sub, by the way, is when it's on, on the surface. So who knew? That's one of those things I learned. So they're on the surface. Let's look at their dynamics. First of all, you observe some consistency to the dynamics we've seen earlier. Dyadic and the outlier are both the commonest states, and the commonest of all is dyadic. So the commonest state of the submarine crew is when most of them are on some and a small group is separated. So it's important to note that that doesn't necessarily mean bad. To know if that's good or bad, you would need to talk to an expert submariner, or be any other team of them, someone that's been driving boats for many, many years, and say, is this good? Is this the way a good team would look? You need some expert opinion to interpret their chart. But look at this. From collegiate to dormant, that's a zero transition. They never go from collegiate to dormant, and they never go from collegiate to dominant. Isn't that fascinating? They never go from a state where everybody's equally engaged straight away to one person running the show and everybody follows. It's sort of more like driving from Washington to Baltimore via the gas station. You're not there long, but you do need to stop at the gas station. One other thing I'll show you. Remember what I said about everybody's kumbaya in collegiate and we hold hands? That's what's in all the leadership books, it's what we're told to teach. And frequently when we do, tell me who else has had this experience, people just going up. Who, who's seen the communal sign when we talk about everybody hold hands and work together? Anybody? I see a lot of smiles and nodding heads. Why is that? Are they wrong? Are we wrong? Are we just using such cliched methods that it's the methods they're laughing at? What's going on? The answer turns out to be something far more fundamental. The best teams in the world and they're in collegiate mode for how much of the time? About one percent. So when we think something's wrong with our teams because they're not collegiate all the time, we need to give ourselves a break. That's what I learned from that. It is not normal for teams to be collegiate all the time. Our two volunteers, where are you, both of you? Um, would you say it was quite difficult to get to the, to get that thing to go straight? No, wouldn't quite get difficult, but it, it, you know. Required a little bit of additional focus than I anticipated. Thank you. Nick? Yeah, yeah, I agree. 
So imagine instead of two of you, there'd be 15 of you. And we've rigged it so that the thing wouldn't go straight, that all 15 of you with the green light. So that is what we think is going on. So what we've learned is that the model of team dynamics that really works is much faster. Yes, sir? Well, I was just wondering, is that dynamic model the same as saying nothing, nothing moves fast by committee? You know, that everybody has to, you know, nothing, you know, if you move, you wall, right? It just takes much longer. You think there has to be a lead. I'm a military background. I'm intelligence background. I haven't gave you an intel support. Yeah, yeah, sometimes. So I think what you're saying, sir, is, sorry, I don't know your name. That's Bray. What Bray is saying, I think, is one of the things he's getting from that in his own experience, is if you set up a team so that you can only do something when every single person around the table agrees with the course of action, if you wait till then, you might be waiting a very long wait, which is precisely why the military doesn't do it that way. Yeah. Well, if you got six <laughs> people all the same mind, frankly, you got five too many people. Right. <laughs> and then you're getting... That's how you value diversity, first thought, but you need somebody to make decisions. And then you're getting into groupthink as well in the Bay of Pigs effect when you have too many people in the same bucket. Absolutely. But, but yeah, that's, that's exactly right. Conversely, if you are waiting for that wonderful collegiate mode to happen and be sustained in a group, and when it doesn't, you assume that can only be because you're a bad leader. My advice to you is to have a cup of coffee and give yourself a break. Stop there, you will be stuck. Mm -hmm. But you don't need to stop there for long. And you, Just long to, enough. and you don't need to go there very often. And you don't need to go there very often, but you do need to be a good leader. And if you never see collegiate behaviour, well, that's definitely a warning sign. Yeah. Because collegiate behaviour, as you can see from those transitions, which we call edges, by the way, if anybody's into the math of it, that model I put up is called the hidden Markov model. And the lines are called edges. Um, you can see from the Markov edges around collegiate, but you do need collegiate. You can't do without it. Five states, both necessary and sufficient. So one of the things that we're working on now is that we finally can produce diagnostic maps of teams. So this is what a team might look like of brand new finance officers who have just been formed. And this might be what the behavior that we see from a team of very experienced finance officers, and you can see the difference between the two. This might be what we see from a team of really good police officers who really got it happening. This might be what we see from a team of police officers who, for some reason or another, are in deep mutual conflict. So we're working on a series of diagnostics right now. There's a paper if anybody's interested in the academics, and I do have 20 copies of the paper with me. We are not allowed to hand out promotional material, and I'm going to stick to that very, very religiously. But copies of an academic paper are fine. I checked. We presented these results to HCI, which is the world's largest conference on cognition, last July, on Stevens and I. It was very well received, the model's been adopted, hence the partnership with those three universities and the NSF grant. So that's the full scientific paper, it's called How Long Is the Coastline of Teamwork? The title is a bit of a joke, but it was a paper, a, a, a paper written by a guy named Benoit Mandelbrot called How Long Is the Coastline of Britain many years ago. It was about complexity and non-linearity. Interestingly enough, the American Psychiatric Association has also decided that neurodynamics will be the method of diagnosis from now on. The DSM-5, which is the current Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders, announces in many places through it, and I brought a copy of it with me today, actually. Hang on. There it is. If anybody wants to check if I'm telling the truth, this is my heavily thumbed DSM-5 Cliff Notes. Most of us use the Cliff Notes more than we use the big book. And every place there's a blue thing in there, there's a commitment for the American Psych Psychiatric Association that neurodynamics will be the primary method of psychiatric classification and diagnosis going forward. So they have completely committed to it. And that's one reason I feel confident when I stand here and tell you that this is the new normal. This is not a fad. This is not this week's bright, shiny thing, and next week we'll have some other bright, shiny thing. It's not a marketing ploy. This is real, and it's going to change everything. 
the trucks on the beach. <laughs> Trisha Galloway, who works for UCLA, is a very, very clever person. And what she did was she worked, we had a team, a nuclear submarine team. What's happening here is they're getting themselves into trouble. They're managing their pollution, it's not going that well. They're getting into a position where suddenly there's a risk of grounding and multiple collisions. You're going to hear a piece of music, believe it or not, that goes for about 30 seconds. What Trisha did was she took those symbols, those entropy symbols that you've seen, and she set them to music. The lower the tone, the lower the entropy. And the commentary's on the screen as the music goes, so if you follow it, you can know what's happening. So, right now, what you're going to be listening to <coughs> is the real brains of a group of real submariners doing real things. It's not imaginary, this is not a teaching exercise, this is the real deal. Real nuclear submariners, you're listening to the team brain. Um, after Ron, Trisha, Corey, me, my wife and Amanda, this audience today will be the sixth group in the world to ever hear what this sounds like. Ready? I might have to cheat a little bit here, I find, to make the audio fine. And I'm going to conduct the trouble song as it goes. transition on the Colin Stevens model and it's fascinating and you can see it. And the thing I like about that model is it's based on neurodynamics, it's based on science, not opinion, but that said, every one of those five states correlates to something I see every day in work teams. It fits common sense very well. 
Everybody remembers this as well. The Albert Tuckman, 1969, and then a revised version in 1977, I think. Forming, storming, norming, performing. No, teams don't do that. Teams don't plot along most of the time. They don't plot along really so. Forming, storming, norming, performing. They do what you saw the submarine team do. They saw what you saw the diagrams do. Teams are fast, they're agile, they move quickly, they change fast, they hop around. That speed and that agility is one of the great secrets of the efficiency of the brain, so let's celebrate it. That's one of the things that makes us efficient when we work in groups. One of the things that makes human beings unique is our ability to work in groups. We used to think it was tool years, then we found out magpies can do that. We used to think it was sentient, then we found out lots of animals are sentient. But the ability to work in groups and the complexity we do is unique to human beings. So let's get rid of that place with this. Folks, I would like to present to you what we suggest to you is the new normal. We think this is going to be the new way ahead for as long as anybody in this room is in the workforce. 50 years from now, people will be laughing at our ideas, just as we laugh at the ideas that are 50 years old. But right now, this is the best we can do. What are the implications for training officers? Well, let's go back to the 14th century. <laughs> this guy here is the king. And this person here is the king's trusty training officer. <laughs> also the most trusted person in the court, the person the king goes to when he really has a problem. The king says, hey, I feel terrible, I feel horrible. I need to go for a rest cure, but I don't know what to do or where to go. I trust you. Can you go and just find out and talk to a few suppliers or something and just pick something that's right? The training officer says, absolutely. So there she is the next day in the inner office with her staff, and one, two, three, four contractors all wearing their best suits. <laughs> she says to contractor one, what should I do? Well, that's Sir Anthony knows everything every time I'm asked, and Sir Anthony says, go north. Go north is the right thing. That's where the good clinic is. It happens to be my clinic. But that's the best place for the king, given what's wrong with it. Along comes Sir Cyril, no you don't. And he replies, go south. South is the new north. North was popular a few years ago. North was the thing to do a few years ago. No argument. But times have moved on. And my clinic in the south is the right place to go. The training officer says, okay. Along comes Sir Andrew do it my way. And he says, both north and south are bad ideas. You need to think of it laterally here. That's what all the books say. Going east is the right solution for you. And certainly for the king. The king should go east. And you know what the fourth consultant's going to say, don't you? So along comes the fourth consultant, elderly, respected, been around forever. This is Sir Central, I've been doing this for 40 years. And he says, go west. West is the new solution. And I've been running that clinic in the west for these 40 years, and we were the best then, and we're still the best now. Which leaves the poor old training officer in a little bit of a bind. What is she to do? The problem is, with the 14th century, and medicine in the 14th century had no measurement. It had no diagnostics. There's no such thing as taking the blood pressure. Therefore, there's no such thing as knowing if blood pressure medication works. Because what do you do? You see the doctor. Oh, gee, the pressure's a bit high. Oh, is it? Yeah, take these pills. Okay. You go back to the doctor three weeks later. How do you know if the pills work? Your pressure's now 120 over 70. The doctor says you're good. That's how you know. None of this exists back then. No x-rays, no MRIs, no medical tests, no blood tests. No, um, certainly no blood pressure, no even concept of what blood pressure is. No idea. So the poor old training officer is in a real bind. Who's she going to pick? The person who's the most distinguished and everybody knows him and loves him. Somebody who seems like they have a really easy new idea. Somebody who's very powerful and well connected. This guy here who's come in cheaper than anybody else. Your guess is as good as mine. Who do you pick? That's where training is today. Training today is where medicine was in the 14th century and for the fault of us suppliers. We haven't given you any decent diagnostics. Better models, better diagnostics are on the way. And that's my message today. I'm not suggesting that all of your classes be connected to EEG headsets, although it may still be appropriate for very specialised teams like special forces and submariners. What I'm really suggesting, of course, is that from this work we are deriving better models. And those models are usable now. Well done to 24. So let's come to the conclusion. Once again, this guy, and I freely admit this is my agenda, um, it, it bothers me that there's such poor science in the field I've chosen to spend my life in that Corey has too. There's no need for it. We can do better. We can move towards things that work. 
This is what we're suggesting is going to be the new normal. So if you go away with anything from today, my preference, you go away, of course, with whatever you wish, but my preference would be that you go away with some incarnation of this, and there absolutely is an iron team. And in fact, the iron team is what caused the Arab Spring, and it's what caused the sudden change in team dynamics. It caused the Enron failure, it caused the Bering Bank failure. That's, that's the new science of nonlinear dynamics. Okay, so at this point, if you could get your little gadgets out, um, I would love to know what your thoughts are. And my question is, as a training officer, if you had better tools to separate what works from what doesn't work in team training, do you care? Is that important? And if so, how important is it or is it? So I've given you 40 seconds for this one, and the time begins now. Oh yeah, that's working. Uh, thank you very much, by the way, um, the, uh, sorry, I forgot the name of the company. The clicker people, who, what? Turning, turning, turning technology. Thank you, Turning Technologies, for helping us with this. It's, it's really very cool. Okay, we've got another 20 seconds, and we're well on time. Okay, and that means time is up, right, turning technologies? Mm -hmm. Okay. Whoa! An almost overwhelming message from the group that having better measurements would help a great deal. That is enormously useful to me. Thank you very much, because I'm also the CEO of this company. <laughs> so, <laughs> that is my homework. I now know we have some of the most accomplished training officers in the country and probably the world in this room right now. And I, well, wouldn't be where you are if you weren't, let's be honest. <laughs> and I now know what the expert opinion is, we better get on with it and give you some better tools. I promise to you that we will. If you want to get in touch with me, that's a QR code. I'll put that back up at the end for those of you who would like QR codes. You're very welcome to do that. I'm happy to discuss what we do, but I'm not going to do that here because we promised the training officers consortium that we wouldn't. But I want to finish on a somewhat humble note because I would hate you to get the idea that we now think we know everything. No, we don't. We've just replaced older models with newer, better models. But we don't have the ultimate knowledge. Or if you want to put more eloquently than that, then I'm going to leave you with the words of the Dalai Lama, the 14th Dalai Lama, who said this to me personally along with about a thousand of my best friends <laughs> in the Washington National Cathedral a few weeks ago. So if you encounter anybody in training who tells you that they know everything about training, learning, and the human mind, my advice is run away. <laughs> it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you. We do have a few minutes of questions. Um, before we do that, I'll just let you know that Corey is going to go outside after this. He's going to go out into the left where we're in nobody's way. And he's going to set the stuff up. And I urge you to come and have a play with it. It's not difficult, is it? It's not painful, right? No, it's real painful, no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that reading. <laughs> it's not real painful, right? Yeah. It's not any worse than my regular electroshock therapy. <laughs> <laughs> So come along and have some fun with us. And we have a couple of other little cards and things that you can control as well. And it really is just a terrific amount of fun and it's amazing to watch. We have a couple of three minutes. I'd be delighted to take any questions that haven't already been asked. question was in the organisations we work with about 30 federal agencies, about 30 or 40 corporates. Um, what are they seeing in this model that's giving them an aha moment? The two biggest things that they're saying, wow, this is really useful, are one, understanding the truth about the collegiate mode and the real reality with the Kumbaya thing. They're getting tremendous relief from being able to go to all those folks who are rolling their eyes and looking at their wristwatches and saying, you know what, you're dead right. Your instincts that this is corny and cheesy and not how the real world works are dead right. But you do absolutely have to have the collegiate mode. You can't disregard it, but nobody expects you'll be in it all the time. That's the first one. The second thing is the market for anticipation. 
that's something that people are really beginning to get interested in because they're seeing now the team dynamics begin to change, not just when they get feedback, but when they think they're about to. And that anticipation and the change in the dynamics prior to the feedback kicks in much earlier than anybody thought it did. And you can actually watch the entropy going down like that. That little gadget we have on the screen was actually setting off little explosive charges because we wanted to get them to get a really positive, yeah, we did it, out of the thing. Um, and it's exciting. And the market for anticipation, the entropy just goes down like a bullet when they have a little vehicle about a foot away from the thing and they think they're about to get it on the next try. The anticipation is really big and we see that too. Thank you for the question. Anything else? Yes, sir. Do you see this as, I mean, I'm looking at this as a potential spender. Uh, I did contract work for a public company. Oh, we're all, so we're all, you know, uh, so we're, by the way, can I just interrupt and say we're talking about Charlton's before? Stephen Covey is the real thing. As I'm sure you'd agree, oh. he's, 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 a, he's a proper psychologist and he was an anti science. He was the real deal. Well, so, I was, so we're always experimenting with what engages when we train. We, of course, yeah. we want people to really like what we're doing and get something out of it that we move the ball you know, when we leave. So I'm just looking at could we use this in our experimental design, our instructional design? Because uh, so, you know, we use test groups for the training, we're most important in test group stuff. And uh, I'd be interested to see if we could this to better tailor the design of the stuff that we do to get a better I've result. seen this yes, be yes, very yes, purposeful for Oh, that's a lot of Like one of that's the, that's the, really interesting. Yeah. It's one of my favorite models right now because um, you're using it to stigma, but the behavioral piece is really kind of missing from it. So Peter Trust is that, and then uh, I just see how this could apply to it. You're, yeah. Wow. It's well, that's interesting. Well, I don't want to talk. I'd love to talk with y'all fine because uh, we just did for the NSES group yesterday. Speed of trust. There'll be some stuff. You can stay in this room. There's nothing happening here for the next hour. The answer is yes. We'd love to work with you, and by all means, leave with a copy of the academic paper. Um, the yeah, one thing, sure. the one thing I'll add to that is we have made a deliberate decision to not pursue the proprietary intellectual property only we can use it route. This stuff is in the public domain. You're absolutely welcome to use it. We felt that the right thing to do was worry about advancing human knowledge first and think about self-interest later. So it's an academic paper. It's widely published. Please take a copy before you go and everything you need is in there. Time for one more question, then I'm going to say thank you. All right, well, in that case, please remember that Corey is going to head right out there right now and get ready to let you play with the toys while I pack up in here. It has been an absolute pleasure speaking with you today. I hope I see you out on the Neurodynamic Gadget. And thank you very much for your time. Please give yourselves a big hand. Thank you.